y'all. It's from the West Barn with Joe West and Mike Shimshek. And, um, you know, I guess we, there's an explanation to here. We, uh, what are we? We're podcast, right? We're podcast. But, you know, who are we for? I guess, you know, we want to be for anybody who's interested in the creative arts. But, you know, I would say we are a creative entrepreneur and artist podcast. Most of the people we have on are in that field. And if, if somebody's inspirational outside of that field, they may make their way onto this, hopefully, this podcast. Today, we're lucky to have a good friend of both of Mike Shimshak's and, and mine, Near Z. Hello. Noted drummer. The great Near Z. Famed drummer, studio musician, uh, spectacular friend. <laughs> and um, and we've known Near forever. Uh, so it, it kind of maybe- 20 did, years. Kind of maybe 20 years? 20? No? Yeah. yeah I was 20. 20. At least. 20. I, met, I met him on the Moffat's record in New York City. Uh, it's like late 90s? No, yeah. mid 90s. 97, 96. Last century. Yeah. Uh, but one thing I can say <laughs> defin- definitively about Near Z is that anytime he plays on a record, you know it's him. And with a drummer, that's difficult. You know, there was like that guy from the Spin Doctors or Stuart Copeland or maybe Don Henley, you know, where you know, hey, that's that dude playing drums. You're one of those guys. And um, I'm not sure how that happens, but. It brings a little bit of personality and magic to it, and it seems like people follow you around the world to get that or call you from around the world to get that. So congratulations. You're a spectacular. You know, we're good friends, so maybe we don't say it enough, but you're a really amazing musician. Drummer of the year. By Drummer the of the year from uh, Music Row magazine? That's last year. Last year. Well, this year. Not this year. <laughs> That's over, son. Last year. Who knows? So um, no. uh, Drummer of the year also has is played on a billion number one so he was a big session drummer as well mm. as doing live stuff he toured with the rock band genesis and did uh what was the record something the alarms sound the alarms what was the genesis record you did oh calling calling all stations calling all stations chris cornell uh played on his solo record played uh, on the carry first on. yeah played on the first john mayer record yeah. uh and countless others and since he's moved to nashville he's dominated the drumming scene in uh, any one position, maybe there's three guys that can lay claim to being the dominant uh, person in that position. And Nier is one of those guys. He's played on, do you even know how many hits in Nashville you've played on? Not really, honestly. Tons. No. In yeah. tons. Mike always, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, I, I believe Mike that he has one. no idea. <laughs> yeah. Mike always the one who pointed out, you know. Um, I'm always calling him and saying, hey, man, congratulations. You got the number one record. He's like, oh, I do? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's moving. You know, that's the, the thing about being someone like that. He's always doing the next thing. He's got a beautiful home studio, which he does a ton of tracking in. Uh, and he works everywhere in Nashville as well as around the world. He also was the drummer from um, the That Sound collection. You and what's your buddy's name? Uh, Jeff Giuliano. Yep. Had a really famous uh, sound plugin or a sample plugin pack for the, I Want That Sound, which recently got acquired by Splice. Yes. And um, he Don't was... Try. He was Superior. the original yeah. drummer for Superior Drummer. So all those Superior Drummer sounds you're using all across the country and across the world are Mr. Nears- Nearsy. So yeah, we you're created dude. the devil. <laughs> <laughs> you, you literally created the monster that will one day replace you. Uh, we have, actually, you know. A yeah, mutual well, friend, uh, Neil Dorsman, I remember when we were uh, debating, are we going to do it? Are we not going to do it? Are we going to do it? We're not going to do it. We felt really bad because it was so new. You guys didn't know about it. No. Nobody knew. I had no idea, like, how detailed this software would be, you know? It became a replacement, really. Uh, there were some major records out there who were actually using this software. So you and Neil Dorsman had the conversation as to whether ethically you should do it. Oh, 100%. I remember to this day, it was like 1 a.m. You guys both remember. I don't know if you actually were there, but my studio in Brooklyn. Yeah. We had to make a decision by Thursday night <laughs> if we in or we out because we had the opportunity to go to the into the hit factory in New York. And that was the last three days of the studio, meaning the following Monday, they start breaking down the studio. Oh, yeah. oh, wow. So we got Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That's it. Literally by 1 a.m. on Thursday night. I mean, Thursday morning, Neil and I still on the phone. And then he goes, you know what, man? If we're not doing this, somebody else will. Exactly. <laughs> you know? 
Of course, and that's the fame Neil Dorseman from Brothers in Arms, Grammy oh, Award yeah. producer and, and his, engineer. Oh, yeah. I mean... Countless other records. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, everything I know, I actually, now I realize that all my engineering skills I've learned from Neil. Most of them, especially when it comes down to drums. What about Mike Shimshak? Mike <laughs> was the first one, <laughs> but that's when we had only one gra- microphone. That was with GarageBand, though, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, In that was with GarageBand. The microphone from the actual laptop. Yeah. So, uh, so you guys struggled with that, but eventually ended up doing it. And, you know, I, I would argue that it does a lot of good. People in our industry argue about, they have that same tired argument that has no outcome on reality. It's like the industry will move in the way that it moves, regardless of how much we try to steer it back to where it was. And without it, we wouldn't have a, a lot of the records that are changing the face of music. With this Billie Eilish record, Her and Her Brother, mm-hmm. they could have used some of your samples. And it's like, wherever good art comes from, good art comes from. And, you know, we could sit around and complain or, or say, hey, back in the old days when I was making $1,000 a day, you know, just renting my Pro Tools rig out to studios. So those days are gone. Oh, long gone. It should just be about the creativity. And, you know, I don't, I'd, I'd argue that you are actually giving people that have, artists that have something that they want to say, why should they have to go through the same expensive process to get their art out? I say the more art, the better. I, I do say, I, I think it's coming back around, though. I think, I know for me personally... You know, I use Nier's program. I use Superior Drummer, and but there's nothing like hiring Nier to play to your. Well, there's an interaction with well, actual also, media at that point where he has an opinion about the piece of music, not just a sound that you're triggering. But also, the user has to be adept at programming drums to sound like Nier. You can use Nier's sounds, and the, right. and there is. I I feel like it's a it's an incredible tool. But do you see this too? That people are starting oh, to yeah. kind of come back around. The programming stuff is starting to maybe subside just a little bit. I'm starting to see the real. I don't see that at all? How do you I, see? see? I totally. I mean, see I that. think there's always going to be great records coming out across all genres, whether they get ignored or whether they get promoted. But it's like this is this is out of the bag. It's out of the bag and across the room. There's just, no way we're. I just feel like it's saturated now, and we're starting to see. He and I, you know, Nears playing on two productions that I'm working on one today and a whole record tomorrow and I tried programming it. <laughs> and it doesn't sound like you know I'm a reasonably good programmer it doesn't sound the same and I'm also I, I feel it and maybe it's just me but I'm feeling like music in general is starting to come back to an organic thing because we've kind of run the course a bit on the programming I think you know, it's like... Well, then there's people that can take that programming and still have heart, like the Billy Eilish record. Sure. Has a ton of yeah, heart. it's incredible. That so record's regardless, incredible. I think we're both saying the same thing, which is as long as there's heart there and it's a real outlet for artistry... I agree. I applaud yeah, that. I agree. And I think that, you know, I want more of that. And I want to be... I, selfishly, I want more for it, of it because I want to find those people and then make records with them because they reveal themselves. In the old days, you couldn't get a record. When you released your CD in the early 90s... Nobody could do that. So it was right. a big deal that you had a CD. It almost legitimized you. Now it's like, you know, you could make a CD on the way home in your car, you know, with, with GarageBand. So, you know, I think that when you get everything out of the way and you just let art sort of simmer, then I think maybe we get exposed to some great things that we wouldn't have got otherwise, and I'm a fan of that. And I think all of us who probably make our money off of people going in and doing it at a higher level probably have a reason not to like that but i like art i want art to win yeah i agree yeah uh you know it, it's it's interesting listen to both of you guys because this is something that i would say a lot of guys like myself uh in a way we we struggle a little bit because you constantly need to adapt and what is it i mean by that it's the fact that you have, in this case, we're talking about a drum software, or it doesn't matter, it can be a guitar software, whatever this is. Um, the guys, who's, who's, this is the only thing they know, really. There is some guys, I worked with guys, who been, the only experience they have with drums, for example, it's been a virtual drummer on the computer. 
And then you're in the studio with them, and you realize that their knowledge they all take on this instrument, it's a completely different animal than what this is all about, you know. If we're talking about dynamic, for example, you know, every instrument, organic instrument, has dynamic. Not everybody, but most everybody, especially the younger generation, because we're so used to music being so loud right now. Everything is so loud, everything is so compressed, in your face. So the dynamic range is literally, if we take the MIDI scale in any software out there, it's end up between 124 to 127, you know. And when they hire you to replace oh, yeah. the software, that become a real challenge sure. as a player, and it changes everything. Uh, I'm sure there is, I, I mean, I had this discussion with some drummer's friends, you know, and it's a challenge. Now, you get to a point where it's like, take it or leave it, you know, because we are, as humans, we don't play like that. We just don't, <laughs> because you do have feelings, you have dynamic, you have emotions, you respond to the music versus uh, a machine, basically. You'll tell the machine, hey, I want you to stay consistent the entire song. Doesn't matter what I say, what I sing, what I play, you know, you just drive. It's on, you're on a cruise. And this is one of the biggest challenge as a, as a studio player, as a drummer these days, uh, especially in the, I would say, you know, pop, modern pop music, modern country pop, whatever this is. I don't know, all those titles are not relevant because they all pretty much involve the same ingredients and same elements and the same idea. Um, back to the, what Mike said about organic music is back. I think that, and this is very subjective of course, because to be honest with you, give you an example. What I do, uh, which, by the way, very important to every session per person out there, you know, sometimes when I just wrap my cables around the studio and stuff like that, I go on iTunes and I play the top 40s, top 40 songs in the background. I would say probably 90% of them got no organic instruments. But I do it anyway because I know that next week I'm in a session and somebody's going to use one of those songs as a reference because this is what's going on out there right now. And that's your responsibility as a session person, as a session player. Sometimes I even, you know, I'll practice drum, just sit behind the drum kit just to play, get the engine going. And I play those songs in the background. They got no acoustic drums whatsoever, you know. Um... And I get it that I see maybe the older generation. Yeah, we are a bit tired of it. You know, I, I won't. I, I won't I, lie I to you. I feel like the I'm, fact that it's ninety percent is exactly why it will change. I. It's saturated. It's 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 time. For I hope you're new. right. It's time for something new. Yeah, listen, I hope you're right. Let's listen, not but, forget that in order to actually get a drum sound that can compete with the samples, you're going to have a space to do it, microphones, people that know how to record it. So it, it makes yeah, it more but, difficult but to do. I, I got to be honest with you. I think that sound. Honestly, it's not as relevant anymore. Why? Because we all became so spoiled. It's so easy to produce and get expensive sounding instruments right now. Get native instruments, whatever this is. You know, it's like the ultimate samples, ultimate recordings and everything. Good point, like triggering. Oh, I mean, it's really not relevant. You know, I always, you know, I always have this saying, and you guys heard me saying this before, you know, I got, God knows, 50, 60 snare drums, whatever, you know. They all sound amazing when they play it on a great song. If you have a great song, it's all going to sound amazing. That's true. You know, because we're always going back to the old days, all those classic songs. I mean, listen to the Beatles. When you really listen, okay, if you mute the vocals 
and try to avoid the song, sonically, it's it's nice. <laughs> you know, it's it's. Uh, I don't want any Beatles Beatles uh, fan I out there to to shoot me, but I'm not. I'm I'm saying what I mean by that. It's all about the song. Yeah, I know. It's the same thing with Aerosmith. Like if you listen to just the music of Aerosmith, it's it's a great rock band. But without Steven Tyler's vocal and melody, it's like the song essentially. It really doesn't move me half as much. Yeah, and and again, you know, and we actually we are we in Nashville. I mean, both of you guys are great songwriters. I mean, I'm don't need to tell you, and I'm telling you, could as you a tell player. us one more time? <laughs> both of us, could you bring amazing songwriters over here, guys? Wait a minute, I stepped on you. Say it again. <laughs> and they're very independent, and they made it. So you, let me, I want to go back to something that you were saying. I want to know, mm. as a session musician, so people may not know this, but in this town, sessions roll on a union schedule, which is 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. 10 and a 2 six, and a 6, 6 right? to 9. So yeah. you could conceivably go to three different sessions at three different studios in one day, which I'm sure that you do. And uh, we'll get into talking about how you get mm. your gear around and all that, but right. you have drum kits sort of uh, uh, lily padding or jump, you know, hopscotching from different different yeah. venues. Um, I want to know, what are some of the things that are your biggest pet peeves when you're sitting behind your drum kit and they play you the work tape? Because this is how it goes. The session starts, someone plays an iPhone recording of this song, mm -hmm. and then the songwriter or the producer will then proceed to tell you what they want. Mm -hmm. What are your biggest pet peeves in the most common things that you hear over and over again? References and or cliches. You know, the references are always, you know, every six months, every year, there is something out there that changes the music industry in present time. You know, what I mean by that, you know, let's, let's go back for a second. Remember Coldplay. Okay, ov obviously, we all love Coldplay. There you go. Clocks, great song. I cannot tell you how many songs I played that people ask me to play this groove, this pattern, and sorry guys, many, many cases, it wasn't the right thing to do, but you know, people get locked into this. Oh my God, this song is on the radio. Huge success. Everybody loving it. If I'll copy the production, if I'll copy the sounds, and on and on and on and on and on, I might be there. And you know what? This is the one thing that I see so many times that something going on out there and there is thousands of really talented musicians chasing this success okay let's go even room for squares Joan Mayer I was living in New York at the time I mean I'm very proud of this record it's a great record it's original handless I cannot even count how many guys we're trying to follow the path. Now, I know it sounds harsh, and you guys know me better than that. I mean, you know, I'm just saying things as they are. There is a fine line between influence and blindly trying to copy something that does exist out there. You know? And... Said more than that. To me, it's like seeing somebody plays is play an instrument with a cover song. Okay, okay. So you learn, you copy the part. You know what? They recorded that. They created that. It's pointless. It's technical. And there is this is the fine line. You know, you bring something fresh to the table. You if you notice that, you just mentioned Billie Eilish. Look what happened. God, how many female singers out there? Amazing singers. Really amazing. And this girl come, come along, whispering into the microphone. All of a sudden, you know, it's like when everybody's yelling in the room. It's like thousands of people are yelling. And, and then all of a sudden, somebody speak really quietly. And what happened? 
everybody. Right. Silence. And as people start to listen, you know. And it's amazing that when you look back at things, it's a pattern. So at the time it happened with Back to Black, Amy Winehouse, one of the greatest records, I think, in my book. Same thing. Adele. And on and on and on and on and on. And back to your question, those are perfect examples for records that actually changes or I would say that really influenced us as a session guys, as session musicians, um, this record become a cloud, <laughs> you know? Like every, okay, for the next six months, I'm going to the studio, every session I go, Billie Eilish is right here. You need to be aware of that. You know what I mean? Five years back, it was Amy Winehouse. Ten years ago, it was Coldplay. 15 years ago, so whatever, it was Nirvana. You know, so, but it is what it is. It's just the nature of us as humans. You so, know, some so see you, through, some don't. You need to adapt. <clears throat> so how do you deal with this? I, You're one of the musicians to me. You're an artist first. You're an artist. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you have the, you yeah. have, you have all the makings of a real artist to me. As opposed to, there, to me, there's musicians and then there's artists. Yeah, the You're one. The, artist, you, how do you? You mean depression? Got you. Okay. No, uh, but no, I mean, it's, it's like okay. <laughs> you know, you you have your your instrument is an art, you know, um, and you you approach it like an art. How do you deal in studio sessions where they almost want you to be like a robot and not you? That you're 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 having you're to take right. the art out of it. And do exactly what somebody's asking you to do. Yeah. How, um, do, you, how do you do that? To be with honest that? with you, I might doing a big mistake here right now, but I'm not really great at that. Mo I mean, not always, but... And I'm not criticizing any of my colleagues, friends, session guys. You know, some guys can just... Cool. That's what you want me to play. That's what I'll play even though I know in my heart that this part, this thing has nothing to do with your music, you know, it's a challenge. It's a constant challenge, yeah. you know? I mean, there is nothing more difficult to me, for example, because let's, let's rephrase, okay? I'll give you an example. You know, when you play your instrument, doesn't matter what, you play bass or you play drums or you play guitar, any instrument, there is the situation when you play the song and it's all play itself. You become part of this whole sound, this story, the journey, whatever the experience is. And there is a situation when somebody can ask you to play something, even though you try really hard to find your way, find your lane, make sense of it, You can sense that you afford something that really doesn't clue, doesn't, it can be in time, can be in tune, everything can be correct by the book, but there is something that just doesn't clue there, you know? And that's a challenge. I, I think that's one of the biggest challenge being a session, per, a session guy, but you know, some, some people look, treat it as like, uh, it's like a curse. I mean, being a, uh, just a session musician, you know. No, I'm an artist. Y you know, and, and I want to give you my perspective. I want to give you my art. I've noticed music. that about you. Like, on a session, you legitimately care. So, you take it personally if it, if it doesn't creatively go to where, it wants, where, it should, where you feel like it should go. Yeah, like again, it it's matters. Where other guys will just look at their phone or go out on the porch or whatever. Oh yeah, it's it's definitely I, it's a failure to me. I've always know? thought. So like, I started in New York, where like you just had to sort of play everything because that's kind of the setup in New York. You know, you figure out and you're you're tracking everything. You know, one at a time, and 
maybe you'll have a drummer and a bass player together, but that was about it. New York City, whenever right. I was when I was working there, and so when I came to Nashville, I was kind of ball hogging my productions. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like I was talking to the drummer about where he should put his kick drum, and I was telling him where to do every single push. And pushes are important, but I was telling him every you know, hey, let's go to this and let's go to hit the back beats here. And I I slowly realized in a town like Nashville that has such a high level of artists that are musicians that I was doing a disservice to the record. So I slowly started to hire guys that I really respected. Guys that I would like go out and see them if they were playing Third and Lindsley as a solo artist. And I would, then I would just force myself to be quiet. And we have a session here tomorrow. We're going to have a full sure. tracking date here tomorrow. In that session, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but anytime I bring the five guys, there'll be f- six players in the room tomorrow. Uh, I will play them the song, and then I'll let them play through it a couple times. But that's, this is the point, because I always say... I learned sorry, that. That was a learned behavior. It's, always, it's a learning behavior for, for me as well, because I always say to you as a producer, you know, first of all, you got to have communication, obviously. You know, yeah, I would like to get some direction. I, I, I always want to know what is your vision. I mean, especially if you just played me a complete naked song... Um, there is a guitar and vocals and you listen to it and we can take it in so many different directions. I want to get some input. I want to get the idea, okay, what is it you're trying to create here? So I love communication, but my tip always, you know, for the producer, if you, you have a vision or somewhat have a vision, but at the same time you just brought in five guys that you trust let them go for 20 minutes 30 minutes we can always go back to the save mode right you always know what you We, originally thought it might sound like and exactly. i would argue like on steely dan records you bring in a new band the next day there might be a different opportunity with those guys that wasn't there the day before one 100 so it's like okay if you want the song to win And that's what we should all agree upon when we go into the studio to cut right. stuff. If you want the song to win, maybe you step back and say, hey, I already know what I think it should be, so I'm going to hold that in my back pocket. I'm going to let these guys do their thing. And almost eight, nine times out of ten, there's a, there's a read, there's something in it that would not have been there had I forced my vision. The other thing I noticed is when you work with a musician, most of them are very kind humans. They want you to be happy, at least the guys oh, yeah. here in Nashville. As soon as I start telling them that their their whole countenance goes into tax accountant mode where they're remembering and doing something as they were they're reading it from a book rather than digging into their art why they started playing their instrument what they bring to the table so i found that i get the super version of the song and if if something from my original vision isn't there we'll go back and grab that as an overdub or a punch in but i find that as a producer you almost have to scale yourself back to not be a super producer where you're ball hogging it and let the song, because the song is going to have a better outcome. And in Nashville, that's really the case. When you get five guys in a room, they play totally different than a track built production because you're listening to what the guitar player's doing and moving, nudging this right. way and that way. But, and, you know, unless, and, and we do it as well. I mean, and, and again, this is a very, it's important, you know, because as you, we talk about something that, has so many different point of view, you know. It's it's not like right or wrong, okay. I can just recommend here. Um, they, like I, I mentioned before, communication, you know, and um, take advantage of those great musicians in the room. You know, you need to lead the session. You are the producer. You need to It's your word at the end of the session. It's your call, okay? That's the way I want it. That's the way, but don't miss the journey. Don't miss the opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me, to get some stuff from guys that you never thought of. You would never think about it, you know? Um And again, I got to a point now when I kind of, I divide it into two because we get to do those sessions, give you a perfect example, 
you know, legendary, you both know the person, Brent Mayer. Amazing person, amazing musician. Um, he's an amazing example. He's a perfect example for someone who hired the musicians, played a song, and just have a big smile on his face. Okay, make sure everything sounds right. And let it happen. It's casting. Exactly. Yeah, it's casting. That's you bring perfect. The, you bring the guys in, and you let them do their thing. You totally right. And it just, years of experience, obviously, and um, just timing. It is timing is when to say and what to say, you know. It's like when something magical happened or some idea, even a mistake, it's to point this thing out in the right time with very few words that actually lead it to the next level. You know, and I'm saying that, I mean, that's a person that I've done a lot of projects with, you know, way before actually I moved to Nashville. Um, but also there is the situations where guys come up, they come into the studio with a full production. You know, we call it a demo, but it's a full production. You know, you could release it like that. Right. And that's a challenge by itself because, man, how, do you, how are we going to win this demo, it's all done. It's mixed. It's it's like, how are you going to win it? You're like a MIDI instrument at that point because you're just going to recreate. You recreate exactly. You recreate. You recreate, and in many cases, you know the producers. And by the way, it can be the producer. And there is the record label. In the background, you hear the producer said, "Dude, the label love the demo." That's what they want. Now, they hired me to recreate the demo. So it might be a bit better sonically. You know, there is a human being playing. Um, but it is what it is, you know. And, and, and there is the aspect of this is where you become... Uh, you just give service. And really. you got to resolve yourself that part of your creative life is going to be I'm working today. This is like me digging my ditch. And then there's some days where you really get your creative side 100%. filled up. You know, and I guess you have, as a musician, you have to like make sure that you don't go too long by just being an implement to take, to replay parts. You got to put yourself in situations where you're not facing down the barrel of no creativity for yourself. It's going to be difficult with your, you make your own schedule. You, yeah, but, you know. You don't control I mean, what comes yeah. into it, necessarily. You, you're, leading, you're leading us to another, to a whole other conversation in this world, which is, it's a fair conversation. It's a fair point because, tell you what, a mutual friend of ours, a guy we both respect a lot, I mean, Tom Bukovac, one of the, in my book, one of the best guitar players. Thought you talking about me. Uh, no, uh, you'll, you'll come next. Shimshak? Bukashak. Yeah. <laughs> and he asked me once, you know, we had this run. I'm talking, I've been here for three years, four years. And it's we had a really good run of like, I don't know, a couple of months or, you know, a few different projects. And they all sounded great. They all were very well done, you know, but they were pretty similar, you know. And, and Book asked me during lunch, he goes, okay, after all this time here, how would you... What's the difference between us here and your experience in New York? And I didn't think about it. I, I, I just said it right away. And I said, you know, it seems like people getting way too comfortable here. And everybody looked at me like, what do you mean? I mean, the musicians are amazing. But what I mean by saying you get too comfortable is, especially when you get to a routine, when you pretty much did the same thing for the last six weeks. You know, you, this part of your brain, there's a big part of your brain who right. basically become numb because 
okay, I'm a professional, I'm giving service, okay, this is what the record label wants, that's what the producer wants, <laughs> that's what the artist wants. So here I am, all right, let's do it. You know, and those are the, to me anyway, it's, it's the biggest challenge to how to balance it. I mean, you both know I started to invite musicians to my studio just to play music for the sake of music because, man, you can lose your mind, you know? Here's another thing that um, the biggest difference between new, a market like New York City and probably Los Angeles and around the world in Nashville was uh, we would go to make a record and the first day would be spent getting drum sounds. And then the second day you were just, you go hours on a song. Here in a normal session that you have 10, two and six, from 10 to one, it's not at all uncommon. And in fact, when I was signed to Sony, I did all of my demo sessions had five songs in three hours. Oh yeah. And I think I calculated, I think it's about 36 minutes a song you get and you've got to be, you got to play the song. They've got to not know anything. So you've got to be an incredible musician. I mean, it's a testimony to the musicianship. And then you've got to go in and play it once, twice, three times, get your take, get all of the overdubs. Everything except for the lead vocal is done in three hours for five songs. Five songs. That's very different between New York and LA. We'd sit around in New York. Never seen any place on earth because that was, all you day. were here, I mean, when I moved here. Yeah. It was shocking. It yeah. really was shocking That's, experience. That also, that also ties the musician's hands because there's no time to experiment with sound. There isn't. You know, no. There's like the but there is some players. values to it. Though. Yeah. There is, there is some values and I'll, I'll explain what this is because if you... You know, I took it as a, you know, when I moved here, like, and, and by the way, let's make it clear, in Nashville, everybody's doing everything, you know. Um, a demo session, master session, it's, it doesn't matter. You go into the studio and you're going to play music. Uh, the demo sessions, um, if you're not sharp enough and and you're not a team player, there is no way you can survive those sessions. Because like Joe said, five songs in three hours, it's a lot of information. It's a lot of information. So as a session player, you get to a point, you develop this skill, what I call it, you're going into the save mode. You know, each musician has this natural respond to things that he right. hear. You're not going to do the evil can evil jump. No, you're not going because <laughs> you can't because you don't have the luxury, you don't have the time. But what's the positive side? The positive side is that you get to if you what do you do with it? I used to go home and like okay, I want to be able to execute this kind of performance in 10 minutes studio time. Versus three hours. Versus three hours. Yeah. You know, and that's where you become a better player. This is when you become a better musician. Well, I'll, I'll say that because I was saying this, thinking the same thing. It's like, it's frustrating and limiting, but it's also liberating. Like there's a song exercise that I give to some friends if they're telling me they're stagnant in writing. Mm -hmm. I say, well, commit to uh, an exercise twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays and start a wall clock and it f start writing something. And then at 15 minutes, stop wherever you're at, record it. Then do four of them in one hour, four 15 minutes. At the end of the week, you have eight song ideas. Go back and find the song idea that you actually think has some value and finish it. How many times have we gone and beat the death out of something that wasn't worthy of being beat the death out of because we were just committed to being there doing it? So I, I think that the great artistry, and you get records like a Carole King record, they might not happen as much in this culture. But you do get to recognize with the speed that there's an efficiency in like this quick brainstorming aspect to it where you really end up with some incredible things that are just there. They show up in the room, like shifting gears. So I actually think there's some really great value to that as well as a challenge. I want to ask you a question. Mm. The John Mayer record. Mm. What was the, the first single around the halls of my high school? No such thing. No such thing. That was the, I, I don't remember the first so, song, but maybe. Yeah. The first song on the record is the first thing. I love your drum part on that. And I love the way you enter 
so. you enter that song in kind of an awkward way, right? Uh, because I used to be a cigarette smoker. <laughs> what do you mean? I used to I used to smoke cigarettes. You know, I I had a big ash tree next to me, smoking was, in the studio. Oh, we used to smoke in the studio. Yeah, I'm so sorry, kids. Don't do that. <laughs> Yeah. So tell me, you guys are you can might you tell remember. Us, I remember this. I love this story. It's can you tell us the story? No, I just it, it just happened. You know, I'm you trying, were supposed to be playing through that intro, correct? I, we were supposed to do something, but I pretty much, I think he started the song, and I kind of put the cigarette in the ashtray, and just wherever you were, you came in. Just because came. Kinda, welcome to the. Room. I always thought that the entry that I was like, that is, I would not have thought to come in there. Now yeah. I know why. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah, I had to sacrifice many years of my life smoking cigarettes for this intro. Uh, <laughs> so, so what was that? What was that like playing on that record? That's a very influential record. That is one of the most influential records, I think, of our time. I know, you you still get people coming to you because of your work on that record, and. I still have people that I work with that cite that record as one of the main inspirations for their own art. I mean, I I think we need to give the credit to the artist himself, you know, his songs, his voice, his approach in general. You know, it's, I'm, I'm not sure what this is, but it's kind of meant to be, you know. I can tell you from a player perspective who I took part in this record, um, at that time, one of the things that they were trying to avoid, okay, how can we keep him as an, as an artist as pure as possible? You know, for example, at that time, many of those songs could go into like Dave Matthews direction yeah, I get that. and stuff like that. And that was a bit of a challenge to put it aside, you know, be very objective, you know. I can give you an example, uh, and I know many people were really surprised. One of the songs that took the longest, when you listen to it, it's one of the simple ones on the record. You know, and it's not no such thing. Not any, it's your, your body is a wonderland, because, and you listen to it. It's the most simple, simple production. You know, it just groove and it feels good, and it is what it is. Um, and it took hours. I mean, it was like two, three a.m. by the time we actually cut the song. You know, um, I guess it's this thing. Uh, it was in the right time, the right place, the right everything. Did Great song. Did you feel that good in the studio when you were making that record? Did you yeah, know that I this felt, is a special thing? I, I felt that, and I think many people heard me say that right after. Um, you had called Pete Robinson, I know, after. Because Pete had re referred you to that record, correct? Our yeah, friend, our, our friend, friend Pete. Our publisher, yeah. Pete Robinson. Uh, yeah, and I told him, sign this guy right away. I remember you saying that. Yeah. Oh, he didn't yeah. have a record deal during the recording. No, uh, they had some... You know, I don't want to give you wrong information. I can't remember. They have some kind of deal, but Pete was on Epic Records at the time. So what, was John on Epic? No, what no, was he no. Was Aware Records. Aware oh, Records, yeah, right? Yeah, Gary, which was Greg Latterman. Greg Latterman's based on Chicago. They were a super influential, wow, yeah. great record yeah. label. Compilations, and mostly, then they right? eventually, I believe, partnered with Columbia. Yeah. Yes, yes. And by the way, Pete' answer was, "Hey, I know he's great." But, you know, we have Dave Matthews Band already, and we have... And I've said to him, <laughs> I said, I don't care if you got all of those artists. You need to sign this guy. Because it was very obvious, you know. And that's... You know, I, had, I did this interview a few days back, um, a week ago, whatever, and, of course, everybody asked about this record. And going back to being a session player... That's a great example, you know. As proud as I am, I mean, I, I love the record. I think everybody did a great job. But there's so many other records that I will proudly, you know, present my work <laughs> with them who didn't succeed as yeah. much. Right. You know, and, and this is... That's one thing that gets me when people come up and they'll say, I've got this brother-in-law or a friend who's amazing or this guy's daughter 
It's just yeah. amazing. And it's like, I don't doubt that they're amazing. But what they yeah. don't realize is that there's a whole ocean of people that are amazing. Yeah. And it's, we only get to see the couple that end up sort of being the yeah. buoys on top You of really get to see just a little bit. Man, Can, I cannot even count how many amazing talent I came across over the years that in many cases really broke my heart. What was the, what's yeah. your favorite record that never was heard of? That you thought, man, this really deserves a shot and never made it? I think that I can give you a general example. I think, I mean, she's not completely unknown, but I think she's one of the greatest artists I ever worked with, which is Alana Davis. You know, there is an, there is an example for someone who should have been really up there As big as John Mary's, Alana Davis should have been up there, you know? And I doubt it if any of my musician's friends would disagree because she's just natural. She's original, she's natural, she's an incredible musician. And, but again, this is going to lead us to a whole other conversation when we're talking about the music business. You know, there is so many elements involved, you know, right. especially leading us to this day. Let, we're talking about making records. Man, right now, it's the easiest thing to do. To make a record, it's the easiest thing to do. If you have a great song, we can walk into any studio, home studio. We can actually make the product. The biggest challenge, what do you do with it? Right. how you deal with it, you know? And we're talking about something that li literally in the last few weeks, because I'm working with a new up and coming artist, learning more about the business still blows my mind. How much energy, how much money it takes to put a song on the radio? Oh, yeah. You know, most people don't know that. It's like a million dollar easy spending in order for people who will hear this song. doesn't yeah. matter how great this song is. And it's frustrating for a creator or anyone associated with a creation to then hand it off to someone and then you're just literally, it's like you, you're running the, running the craps table. And it's it's like, a roulette. It's what's like, going to happen? Yeah, what's going like to happen? Everything that I care about is right here and it's like, the probability that it will actually land on your number is, it doesn't make you not do it again, but it makes you want to figure out, hey, how can I weigh the odds in, uh, against the house and towards my song or my production or the thing I'm working on? Yeah. Oh, how long I'm going to, how long I'm going to hang in, you yeah. know? It's like I'm learning about, recently I've been learning more about country radio. It's, it's kind of weird because I've, done it what for the last 10 years I was very fortunate to play on some really big number one songs with top artists here and now I'm learning where's the starting point and what it takes to break a new artist what it takes to break a female artist in the country radio are we talking 10% versus 90% between female and male I think it is That's unheard of. That, that's pretty embarrassing, to be honest with you. And I'm saying that because, dude, I never heard so many amazing singers, real talents like I heard in Nashville. I mean, there is some amazing female artist out there. And somebody put it in my face recently, dude, it's 10%. 90%. Yeah. It's to 2020. That number can't, that's like... I know they're saying it's a reaction to the marketplace and, and it's what sells and why I complain about but how much of that is really, if you just put it out there and actually gave it in a marketplace an opportunity and let people really decide, is it chicken or the egg? Are we, is it 90-10 because we're playing 90% more male artists? It's an impossible field. And then to, I don't know. Then to be a woman in that field seems almost impossible to to break through. But they're, the people that do it are fantastic. I think Miranda Lambert, every record she puts out, I'm really interested in. Casey Musgraves, and, you know, Carrie Underwood. I'm a big fan of... Amazing. Even the Kelsey Ballerini stuff, it might be a little bit more pop. You would think a guy 50 years old would enjoy it. I love that stuff. 
So I think they've got a lot of great things to offer. I just wonder why it is so tough for any creator, male or female. You know, it's like, that's why you have to love it. You have to be in it for the right reasons or you will not make it past the finish line. You do, I mean, 100%. I mean, this is our life. Doesn't matter what, I mean, I think all of us do it for the love of music you either you are that. i mean there is no no question about it but i'm still uh, it's hard for me to accept and the fact that why is it so more difficult for a female artist to yeah. break through and when you look than at a pop, male artist yeah i just exactly. don't get it you know, pop and music I, is the same, and I'd, I'd say I'd argue that the demographics with streaming is skewing a, a, a lot younger in the audience. So this, I think that'll, ch I think that might change. I think so too. As streaming uh, starts to, the I data from so. streaming starts pushing towards people making decisions. Decisions. I, I hope so. Well, I don't know. I'm learning. I'm learning right now. To be honest with you, and I know some people, some people in this industry, and I'm just learning. And I, I, nobody actually gave me the reason. They gave me the fact. This is a fact. It's 10% versus 90%. I'd be interested. We're trying to get some folks on that are like the heads of labels. I'd be really interested asking that question to see, because, you know, I don't want to fault anyone for not making money. And if it's like, hey, you can sell hand warmers, mittens, or snowballs in Alaska. If that's the argument and it's a marketplace decision, mm -hmm. it's like, whatever, make the money, let the marketplace decide. But if it's just something that's being run off of old numbers from old terrestrial radio and from Kenny Rogers era, mm -hmm. then maybe there's a different outcome that could happen if we actually uh, look at the new streaming data. Uh, I want to ask you, if you're, so you go from, maybe this is more of a statement. I think it's interesting that you can go from playing on a Genesis record to playing on a Chris Cornell record to playing on a John Mayer re record, mm -hmm. to playing on a Blake Shelton record, to playing on, I mean, the list goes on and on. Who were some of the big hits you've had here in, in Nashville? The Dan and Shay stuff is all you. It's very simple. Florida Georgia Line. It's like, how does a guy... I actually never met those guys, by the way, believe it or not. How does a guy go into a room... <laughs> I played about 14, 15 songs, never and met apply, the band. And apply his art to those mm -hmm. different things and still be valid in each one of those There's dr drastically different genres uh, you know I can speak for myself if I can relate if I like the music I can play it I, I know it sounds it, it sounds weird now all those artists you mentioned especially when you mention someone like Genesis or Chris Cornell I mean those guys are as real as it gets they real you know none of those guys created music just for the sake of oh this is the fashion right now this is what i should do to remain relative um and it does help because when you're in this circle and you play this music that really comes from the heart it's it's actually much easier to play you know, because you have this complete freedom to be creative and be yourself. And so I never look at it as a challenge, you know. And I can give an example, someone like Blake Shelton, you know. Blake Shelton, I've done three or four records with him already. Um, there is an example for someone that is a bit more, you can say is definitely more commercial than what, you know, Chris Cornell was. But... The reason it was so fun and easy, because there is the artist himself who knows his identity. He knows what is he all about. He's, he's so comfortable in his own skin. You know, he never tried to do something else. Something else that oh, just because it's cool right now, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. You know, is. Um, it makes it easier probably for you as a player once the artist knows who they are. Of course. To really fit into the soundscape of what they're trying to do. 100%. You know, it, it makes it so much easier, you know, versus uh, 
artists, which again, it's not about, I don't criticize, it's a natural reaction to this insane business we're in. Because when you sense the artist in real time in the studio, along with a the producer, they still in this search mode, okay? And there's so many birds from all over. Wait a second, should I go this direction? Should I go that direction? Should I do this? Should I do that? It's like, so you, it's easy to fall into it, you know? So the, the entire room, the whole band become like, okay, how should I approach that? You know, um, it's interesting that, because someone else's confidence in their art, then there's no question. It's kind of like this oh, is—it's like a strong current. It's—it's um, it's the best scenario. I've always thought, as a player is the best scenario. So when the artist knows what is it they doing, you know. And by the way, you mentioned, I think when we we'll go back for a second, when you mentioned someone like Miranda. I never worked with her, so but so I'm completely objective. But I think that's a great example for someone who just stick with their own identity and a true art, regardless of radio, regardless of fashion, regardless if whatever record is out there blowing, you know, the whole world. Yeah, you know, and that's something to say about that. And I always, I always say, you know, learn from those people. Because those are the artists who stands out. You know, when you play your instrument, you write a song, you write, be true to yourself. You know, I know, you know what, give an example. There's some drummers out there who, you know, when we're talking about how you hold your sticks, how you play your instrument, oh, this is right, this is wrong, and on and on and on and on and on and on. And some guys will say, you know, Nier, this is why you hit it like you know what yeah that's the way i play that's the way i hit it because that's the sound i want to hear that's how i'm going to produce this sound not because somebody decided somewhere someday that's how you should do it you know and it's but there's the a same freedom, thing there's a freedom that comes in being a great student that once you become a master at something you can now manipulate it and break the well, rules sure and actually go somewhere with the knowledge of the tradition of it, you could take it somewhere where it hasn't been. And your sound is really specific to you. And you turned me on to, I have a Sonar Vintage kit here. Yeah. You turned me on to Sonar. You're with Sonar now. Yep. Sonar drums. Killer drums. And what do you play mostly? Their Vintage kit? On sessions? Lately, know they ask you, you know, two. actually last week, believe it or not, last week we did a record. I got to play the three different models on the same record because that's an example. We had the luxury to spend time and we played the vintage, we played the SQ2 and we played the SQ1. And there was one song that I actually got to mix all of the above, you know. Was so was like this at your vintage. place or at a, at a No, it was in Southern Ground. You in, had three uh, drum kits set up? Three drum kits, not set up. We had one set up and we you. got to change, gotcha. you know. And it's really cool because we don't get to do it a lot. You know, it's much easier to change a guitar in a session. Okay, let's try this one here. Let's try this one. We change the snare. We change the cymbal. We change, you know, uh, but change the whole, change the entire drum kit. It's a real uh, luxury that I wish we get to do more often. You know, uh, because it changes this. It changes everything. It changes yeah. the song. You yeah. know. And then you know, we we're not going to get into it today, but you're also a great engineer. And there's tons of miking techniques like the Glenn Johns thing or an oh, MS yeah. thing or XY and then just It's, kick it's drum an addiction, and, the know, engineering can, part. I it's mean, an, it's a good addiction. It's an incredible thing. We'll talk about it next time. Yeah. You're on. Hopefully you come back on. Um, you were near, near, near was recently on the cover of Modern Drummer, yes? Uh, mo yeah. So congrats on that. Thank you. Um, it's been great talking to you. Um, Thank you. Do you have a website or anything? that How can Actually, people catch up with you? Working on a website right now because this thing came up a lot and I've been told you gotta have a website you know so it's gonna be nearzmusic.com okay not up yet uh, though but soon to be not up, up will be soon will be up nothing special just a way so people can contact me people get some you know have a bit more control on the information out there and people can have you uh, they can find you on Instagram and Facebook yep. and if they have a song that they want to send into town and have you play on you do that at they your own can do studio it from all send them over. all the multi-tracks yeah. back. 
um, or if they want to book a record or talk about you're a great producer as well. We didn't even get into that today. Um, uh, you could look for Nier on, uh, on Instagram. What's your Instagram? Nier Z Music. Okay. Yeah. And your N-I-R-Z Facebook? N-I-R-Z Music. Um, same thing. Okay. And I are like um, the Beatles Nier. Yeah. Man named Nier. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I'm Joe West. You can find me at joe-west.com. And uh, the school was apprenticeacademy.net. And Mike, have you got a website yet? (laughs) He's going the other way. Yeah, just Shaq Jones on Instagram, S-H-A-C-K-J-O-N-Z. He's going to start printing out like a printer press and actually put out papers. That's it, man. And we now have secured the rights to fromthewestbarn.com, so all these episodes will live on there. Yeah, man, we're we're legit here. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Vaughn Head for man in the controls today and producing the show. Thank you, buddy. Thanks, guys. Anything else we well, missed? I just, I just, I just want to say, near near, has single handedly changed my career as a producer. I don't make records without near. I I, I can't. That's once too you get, kind, Poe. It's like it's like a drug addiction. Once you get a taste, you can't go back. I've told you this before yeah. myself, but. Near changes. He's one of the rare people that will change your production. For That's the better. true. I believe that he elevates Costs it me a in a way that very few people say can that. do. That's true. No. He, there's a little bit of DNA and a, a little bit of heart and soul left on every record he it's plays on. Just, he, I will vouch for that as well. It's an honor to know you and be good. Thank buddies you guys. We love you, and we'll see you next time from the Ooh. West Barn.